last year, um, beginning with the class, um, which is based at UNCW, it's a class of um, undergraduate students and graduate students, and together, in collaboration with Chautauqua Institution in upstate New York, we produce a beautiful journal, um, which you'll see up here, our newest issue journeys and pilgrimages. And within the covers, um, we try to maintain the values of Chautauqua, which really is just about being a whole individual intellectually and spiritually. And it's about personal growth. And if you have an opportunity to be on the grounds, it's it's really something marvelous and not something that um, is easily defined unless you actually spend the time there. So uh, just a little bit of history within the last six years, um, Jill and Philip Gerard have become co-editors of the journal. And that means that they kind of steer and make certain that those values are upheld. Um, my job this year is as managing editor so I get to do a lot of the little nitty-gritty things um, like this. Um, the journal is actually more like an anthology in that it comes out once a year, and there's always a theme, and then within the main theme, there are the sections that are the Chautauqua values, like leisure and spirit and art and education. Um, so I think without you know going into a whole lot more detail, we'll have um, going to have Lavon Adams read first, and I think many of you will will know her. Um, she is a lecturer and MFA coordinator at UNCW, and Lavon is the author of three books of poetry, including Through the Glory of the Past. Um, her poems have been published widely in many fine journals and anthologies including Chautauqua. So, LaVon. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very fortunate to be part of this gorgeous journal. I'll show you the journal first off. Um, the poems that I'm going to read are from two different collections. The first one is the book from the book Through the Glorietta Pass, which is about women on the Santa Fe Trail in the mid-1800s. And then the second poem is kind of, um, it was a work in progress when they accepted this. It's now a project hopefully completed, sent out um, a few weeks ago. And it deals with um, Kit Carson and the Navajo Indians and the Long Walk, which was um, kind of relocating the Navajo tribe from um, Arizona to New Mexico, where they were put in something similar to a concentration <coughs> camp. But I'll start out with... Um, Anna Maria Morris, 1850. One private drowned in a swollen river, some wagons were lost, and we were stopped by cholera. Yet our trip along the trail wasn't considered excessively grueling. The soldiers were rarely short on rations, and their duties were clearly defined. Is not some measure of comfort found in knowing what to expect? At least once a week, the cooks roasted a ration of coffee beans over smoldering coals, tied the coffee and a broken egg inside a square of cloth. The packet was dropped into a pot of boiling water. After four minutes, a generous splash of cold water was tossed in to settle the grounds. Our first glimpse of Santa Fe, a town built of clay, was the dash of cold water that settled the grounds of our hopes. Two days after we arrived, an artillery soldier said he was weary with life, put his gun to his head. Why, I wondered, when we had finally reached sanctuary. Could it be possible that what tries us most sorely is what we need to survive? The other poem is, um, this collection is kind of based on the artifacts at the time. And this particular one was this uh photograph of a Navajo girl, and it's just a beautiful old photograph, and it's on postcards, you know, they put those in museums and everything, it's on postcards everywhere, and um, I was really captivated by her face, and I carried around that postcard for about a year before I actually wrote about it, and kind of gave her the history of many of the young women in the Navajo tribe, and that was weaving the blankets, 
And at the time, I met Catherine Billingsley, who is um, the mother of the artist who is also featured in this. And the poem is dedicated to her, so I think that's kind of a wonderful weaving <coughs> happening. The poem itself is called Photograph, Navajo Girl. <coughs> Around your shoulders, the blanket you wove last summer, your first season at the loom. Little more than a buffer from February's wind, it was never intended for this bitter use. Close to childhood, your pulse flutters fast enough to prevent your body from freezing. Yet your feet are ponderous and cold, difficult to lift. While your mouth and skin have hardened, suffering seems to have softened your eyes. There are so many ways to numb. Two days before, your grandmother sank to the ground, curled into herself as she chanted the weaving song, her eyes staring into the past. You expected that one of the soldiers would lift a gun, but they just shrugged. One nudged her with his boot, says she wasn't worth the bullet. In the distance, the sacred mountain gathered more clouds around its head. You had to keep walking, but if you could turn back, you would see that she grew smaller, looked like an abandoned mound of yarn. She once thought you taught you to leave unspindled wool in the sun to give the ground time to absorb its extra oil. Until you shook out that sand, the wool wouldn't be ready to die. Since you've always loved to weave stories, tell yourself that someone from a nearby clan will find her, will carry her back to their hogan and feed her stew rich in pinion nuts. Beneath the blanket of their kindness, like changing woman, she will become young again. Each morning she will wait by the Hogan's door, watching the sun stretch, knowing that its tenuous path might mark your trail back home. Thank you. Thank you, Lamont. So I doubt there's anyone in this room who doesn't know Philip Gerard. Um, but I'll just be a very short bio. <laughs> yeah, that's not what you need to hear. I guess, I guess <laughs> Stick with the public persona, please. <laughs> most, most important is that, is that Philip is a, is the, is a recent chair of the Department of Creating, Creative Writing at UNCW, and he is now on sabbatical and writing and researching a very interesting book about whiskey. Mucha. Mucha. <laughs> One of my happy duties as the person who does the light lifting, as they, Jill and her crew here does the heavy lifting, is to write a little introductory piece to each of the issues that somehow helps to at least capture or set the tone for the theme. And this was Journeys and Pilgrimages. And by the way, you'll notice if you look at this issue and back issues that we always use original art for the covers and also uh, archival photos from the institution. Uh, they have quite a collection, are throughout the book and often used in the cover in conjunction with, uh, with the other art. Anyway, this is called Travels of Bridget, uh, my, my sainted dog. <laughs> we started from Tucson, Arizona at first light. Three graduate students and a seven-week-old black and gray brindled mongrel puppy named Bridget headed home to the East Coast for Christmas. Bridget was my new pal, a lively alert pup who had already chewed up half my shoes and liked to sleep under my pillow. She had showed up at the university office I shared, wandering from across the hall, where the rest of the litter were snuggled under the secretary's desk. When somebody asked, whose puppy is that? The secretary had answered nonchalantly, Phillips. We had four days to get there on time. When I called my parents in Delaware to let them know I was coming, my father had said, don't drive, it's too far. What if something happens to the truck? It's not exactly brand new. Why do they always have to be the expert in everything? He had hardly ever traveled beyond the borders of his little home state, and then only reluctantly. Yet he always spoke with supreme confidence about things far afield from his experience. And my job as a young man was to prove him wrong every chance I got. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen to the truck, I insisted. A four-year-old orange Datsun pickup with 60,000-odd miles on it Previous August, I'd driven it alone all the way to Tucson, packed with all my worldly possessions, including my bicycle strapped on top. Look, he offered, why don't you fly? I'll even buy you a ticket. I don't want you to buy me a plane ticket, I said. 
it was important that I retain the independence I had won over years of doing things the hard way by myself. If I flew, I couldn't take Bridget. Well, my dad said, resigned, if you get in any trouble, call. I'm not going to get in any trouble, I said. Why did he always have to assume things would go wrong? But I couldn't handle them. I had $140 cash in my pocket, enough for any emergency. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, not, not that I was naive. <laughs> it still seems like a lot of money. <laughs> we left in high spirits. Paul, my roommate, sat up front with me. He was a fun-loving MBA student, quick to laugh with longish dark hair and a smile that made him a ladies' man. He was headed home to Connecticut. Rod, a friend from my writing workshop, was going even farther north to Boston. He was tall with wire-rimmed glasses, easygoing and thoughtful. A great guy for long conversations about favorite authors over glasses of beer. Rod had the first shift in the back, protected from the elements by a camper shell. We'd outfitted the back of the pickup with a foam mattress and blankets, along with a box of sandwiches and a large bag of homemade chocolate chip cookies. We rolled down the highway on our adventure, heading home for the holidays. It was a fine, fast trip until Pecos, Texas. Paul was at the wheel and I was riding shotgun. It was after midnight. We were the only vehicle on the road. All at once there came what sounded like a gunshot from under the hood. A dense cloud of white smoke billowed onto the windshield. Paul pulled the truck onto the shoulder. It took an hour before a passing motorist alerted a 24-hour towing service in Pecos. The driver hauled us into town and chewed a toothpick while his mechanic looked under the hood. Start her up, the mechanic said. I turned the key. Immediately, a geyser of oil and water spewed all over the mechanic's overalls. Busted head gasp, he declared, laconically mopping the filthy liquid off his face. Have to go to Odessa. We don't work on foreign cars. The tow truck driver would take us 100 miles, a dollar a mile cash in advance. I peeled off the bills. Before we left, the mechanic noticed Bridget standing at my side. Nice puppy. What is she, a cattle dog? No, I said, just a mutt. So we piled into the tow truck and trundled off. By sunup, we were waiting outside a Datsun dealer in Odessa. When the service manager showed up, he wrote up a work order. Be three, four <laughs> days for I can work you boys in, he said. That was hard news. What's this going to cost, I asked. Seven, eight hundred dollars minimum? Even harder news. Rod held up a credit card. Will you take this? The service manager studied the card. Sure, he said. Hey, pretty little pup you got there. What is she, cattle dog? <laughs> no, I said, just a mutt. He shook his head. Yeah, sure looks like a cattle dog. We pondered what to do over breakfast at the local cafe. The waitress and cook made a fuss over Bridget, petting her and feeding her scraps of bacon. What is she, a cattle dog? <laughs> no, it's just a mutt, I said. It paid some of my last $40. The thing was, I didn't have seven or eight hundred dollars to pay for the repair, even if Rod could put the bill on his credit card. Back in Tucson, I lived from paycheck to meager paycheck as a work-study student. So after breakfast, I did the only thing I could do. I called my father. <coughs> You're never going to believe where I am, <laughs> I said as cheerily as I could, and gave him the whole story. My dad didn't miss a beat. He would get completely panicked or unnerved by small things, a stopped up drain or a missed dental appointment. But when a real crisis came along, he settled down and took easy control. If they'll take Rod's credit card, he said, I'll pay him back in cash when you get here. He kept on assuring me that everything would be fine, told me to give his best wishes to my buddies and drive safe. <clears throat> he put my mom on the phone briefly, and hearing her voice, I felt farther away from her than I think I had ever felt. It dawned on me at that moment that I had left home for good, that I would be gone from home for the rest of my life now, that coming home for a visit would never be a sure thing again, that roadblocks happen on the road home. I could feel myself getting choked up as I promised her, I'll be home for Christmas. In the end, we bypassed the service manager and bribed one of the mechanics to work us in. We gave him a giant wrench we found lying on the interstate in New Mexico. The <laughs> family <laughs> was about that long. <laughs> By nightfall, we were rolling up the miles again. We 
pulled into Delaware on Christmas Eve. Rod and Paul and I shared a meal with my family. Then I drove them to the station and saw them off on the Amtrak to New England. Before we left for the station, my mother gave him a package of sandwiches and pie for the train ride. My father handed Rod an envelope full of cash to pay for the repair bill. Over the years that followed, I tried to repay my father, but he always shrugged me off. He never even said, I told you so. The trip had worn me out. Bridget, though, was spry and happy. Despite all our trials, she had gained two pounds. <laughs> Somewhere between Texas and Baltimore, while Rod was asleep in the back of the truck, she'd finished off all the sandwiches and cookies. <laughs> Travel agreed with her. When he saw Bridget for the first time, my dad, still the expert, said, I've heard about this breed. They use them out west, some kind of cattle dog. <laughs> That's exactly what she is, the world Similarly, 